poverty exists, that it exists, that it persists in the 21st century is an obscenity. We want to end this poverty. We want to make poverty history. to ask ourselves, who is the we who sees poverty? When we see poverty, what is it that we see? And finally, how do we act upon these ways of seeing? Today, we face a stark fact that of a world population of nearly 7 billion people, 2 billion live under conditions of poverty. 1.4 billion live under the unimaginable condition of earning less than $1.25 a day, the international poverty line. The existence of such poverty in the world is now common sense. But what made possible this global conscience? Surely poverty is not new. And so why is it that at certain times in history, poverty becomes visible. The poverty we see today has been made visible by a coming together of various forces, struggles and movements. By the close of the 20th century, the major institutions of development, such as USAID, the World Bank, the United Nations, had made poverty alleviation a top priority. For example, the Millennium Development Goals of the United Nations were created as a pledge to achieve progress on a set of ambitious mandates, ranging from the halving of extreme poverty by the year 2015, to the reduction of maternal mortality, to universal primary school enrollment. But there is more to poverty action. For many decades, the edifices of development, their development elites and poverty experts, set the agenda of international development and foreign aid. But in the new millennium, the impetus for action is widely owned. This is the democratization of development. What do I mean by that? The we who sees poverty is also the we who acts upon poverty. We are part of global poverty action, to reform foreign aid, to reduce hunger, to fight HIV AIDS. We are the millennials, and we are on a mission to make poverty history. Well, maybe you are the millennials. I'm too old. No, not that old, but a little too old to belong to the generation of millennials. The democratization of development requires constant mobilization and inspiration. Iconic figures loom large in this age of millennial development. They inspire, they mobilize, they lead the massive global campaigns to end poverty. From Bill and Melinda Gates, who have built the world's largest philanthropic foundation, to rock stars such as Bono, who have argued that aid and development is about justice, about reparations for past exploitations and dispossessions. Ah, uh, Bono. All right, I will confess that I have a thing for aging rock stars. But Bono performs the democratization of development with a drama that is unmatched. Let me explain. I'm attending the U2 concert at the Oakland Coliseum. 
I'd somehow managed to convince my spouse that this was my gift to him on his birthday. So there we are. Bono is singing Sunday, Bloody Sunday, a tribute to civil rights protests in Northern Ireland. Bono is singing, blindfolded and wrapped in the American flag. The electronic scroll above his head ticks out the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And in that moment, the stadium turns into a classroom. Global Studies 101. We are asked to pull out our cell phones, flip them open, and hold them up as though they're candles. Imagine, our most mundane modern instrument collectively turned into the light of the world. The audience is wearing white wristbands. They have made the millennial promise to make poverty history. I think by now you get my point that poverty action has become a key part of how millennials create a sense of themselves as global citizens. So when I ask the question, who sees poverty? What I'm really asking you to think about is how encounters with poverty shape our place in the world and our place in society. You can call this class identity. You can call this power. And you can argue that the democratization of development is bullshit. Total bullshit. Because only a small privileged group has access to the leisure and resources to take up poverty action. So be it. I don't disagree. But if so, it behooves us to be more thoughtful about the question of seeing poverty. This is ultimately a question about ethics. Ethics not as a set of universal norms, but rather as the philosopher Michel Foucault would have us think about it. Ethics as the practice of the self. My favorite example comes not from our current moment, but rather from the late 19th century. I like to call it Baudelaire in Berkeley. In the 1860s, a French poet called Charles Baudelaire wrote a prose poem about life in the newly recreated modern city of Paris, entitled The Eyes of the Poor. In it, he describes a pair of lovers who sit down at a corner of a new Parisian boulevard in a dazzlingly opulent cafe. All history and all mythology pandering to gluttony. The lovers notice that on the street directly on front of them is a man of about 40, who is described as having a tired face and graying beard, holding a small boy by the hand and carrying on his arm another little thing. The three are in rags. Their eyes stare fixedly at the new cafe with admiration. And their eyes say, how beautiful it is. All the gold of the poor world must have found its way onto those walls. The family of eyes knows that this is a place they cannot enter, and so they simply stand and stare. Suddenly, the man and the couple, the narrator of the poem, is ashamed. He says he's ashamed of our glasses and decanters, too big for our thirst. But his lover is annoyed and asks him to call the proprietor so that the family of rags can be sent away. Those people are insufferable with their saucer eyes, she says. Written well over a hundred years ago, Baudelaire's timeless poem speaks of our daily encounters with poverty. In the liberal city of Berkeley where I teach, homeless men and women seek shelter on the sidewalks and in parks. They panhandle outside grocery stores, at ATM machines, at the cafes that border the campus. They are today's saucer eyes. So you see, the question we've been exploring, who sees poverty, is not sufficient. In this case, as the poor are seen, so they see. They see the dazzling cafe. They see lovers with glasses too big for their thirst. They see gluttony. Let me return to my opening question. Who sees poverty? And let me suggest that the poverty we often see is that of spatially distant neighbors. 
those at a distance, those on a different continent, those for whom we want to do good, those for whom we feel empathy. The poverty we're often unwilling to see, the poverty that makes us squirm, is that of spatially proximate strangers, those we encounter in the intimate routines of our everyday lives, those at home, yet those we render foreign, strange, alien, insufferable. I borrow the phrase spatially distant neighbors from the feminist geographer Doreen Massey, who asks us to think about responsibility at a global scale. This is what the millennial moment is about. What is our relationship with spatially distant neighbors? A few years ago, Vanity Fair ran a special issue on Africa, guest edited by Justin Bieber. No, just kidding. It was guest edited by Bono. Obviously, some celebs be chillin' by the fire, while others stand up for causes. Featured in the Vanity Fair issue were Africans. No, just kidding, not Africans, but rather celebrities who care about Africa. One of the key points of the Vanity Fair issue was that every person on the planet is linked to Africa, that we are all African. This, of course, has been the theme of several poverty action campaigns. Well-meaning and well-intended, they are meant to foster a sense of global neighborliness. But as the rowdy world of internet blogging points out, we are not all Africans, nor are we all Gwyneth Paltrow. So in conclusion, we must ask ourselves, can we transform the ways in which we see poverty? Can we see not only spatially distant neighbors, but also spatially proximate strangers? And how then is the impulse for poverty action transformed? <laughs>